uh, truths about nutritional biochemistry actually don't change. So there are some things that are going to be foundational truths that will be the same as they were you know, 20, uh, you know, 20 years ago or, and 20 years from now is what we're going to be presenting. And some of the primary um, aspects of nutritional biochemistry are not going to really change. But we keep learning more and we keep learning uh, nuances that can be very helpful. And to um, you know, a large extent, I know there's been books written on this subject, um, one of them by uh, William Walsh called Heal Your Biochemistry, Heal Your Brain, which is, you know, there's a lot of truths in that book uh, in regards to healing the brain through biochemistry. And uh, we'll actually get to some of those truths here uh, in the second uh, half today. Uh, but I also want to um, reveal the fact that even if you have perfect biochemistry, your brain can still have problems. And, uh, and it can actually still have distorted, perfect biochemistry. But he still got into distorted thoughts. Uh, magnification, emotional reasoning, a lot of these things, mental filters, etc. And so it's not just biochemistry. I know we had one individual come through our program and he was so focused on the biochemistry he didn't want to have anything to do with anything else in the program. And of course nutrition is, is only, I mean it's a very important piece in the program, but when we take a look at the whole comprehensive approach it's only about 10% of the entire comprehensive approach. And so, but it's a very important 10%. And so, all, he didn't want to have anything to do with the 90%. He just wanted to have to do with the 10%. And of course, looking at all the data that we were um, generating from his blood and urine tests in regards to what's going on in his brain, synaptic activity, all of those sorts of things. And we were able to provide him some significant benefit by determining those biochemical factors and uh, getting things in, in shape. But although his brain was now set up to be able to analyze um, his thoughts for distortions, he had no willingness to do that because he thought it was 100% biochemistry. And since he wasn't willing to try to even correct his own thoughts, uh, that was a significant barrier. Uh, and so sometimes we can uh, major in, you know, in, in biochemistry, in, the, in nutrition, in the brain is not a minor per se, but if that's our only emphasis, 100%, uh, we're going to have problems. And of course, this is one of the reasons why the pharmaceutical industry is limited as well, because the pharmaceutical industry is all about biochemistry in the brain. And it's very well known that the pharmaceuticals have their limitations. And unfortunately, because they're foreign substances, they also have their side effects. And so what we're looking for is to try to get benefits without those side effects. And sometimes it's a lot more beneficial when we look at um, how we can change nutritionally. Now, this is where every pharmaceutical company in the world is trying to manipulate. This is called the synapse. And this is the number one selling drugs in America. If you work at a pharmacy, you are seeing uh, drugs fly off the shelves that are manipulating things in this synapse. And this is where communication occurs. So right in this area here, uh, in that synapse, serotonin is being released. Let's call that serotonin. It's not actually labeled there on the screen. And if the, re and of course, and it's electrical signal that is causing serotonin to be released. And if the um, a receptor is there for serotonin, you can see these receptors are designed enough um, to uh, bind on to that uh, molecule serotonin, then a synapse occurs. In other words, there's synaptic activity, another electrical signal um, goes and communication is occurring in the brain normally. Now once that synapse occurs, or that synaptic activity occurs, the serotonin that was bound here actually gets um, released and it is actually vacuumed back up 
by these reuptake channels. There are little channels there uh, called reuptake channels that are to store serotonin. The brain is very efficient. It doesn't want to waste things. And so after that synaptic activity, it wants to vacuum the serotonin back up into that neuron. Now, the drugs, when your um, doctor gives you a drug and says this is going to help your serotonin level, is it going to actually help that neuron to make more serotonin? Is it going to help you build up more receptors to bind onto serotonin? No. So how is it working? How is it helping your serotonin levels? It, it actually is blocking. No, it's not facilitating reuptake. It's actually blocking the reuptake channels. These molecules are designed to be vacuum cleaner pluggers. And so they plug the vacuum cleaners for serotonin to go back up into the neuron. Now, how does that help your serotonin level? Or how does it help the serotonin activity or the serotonin synapse? It actually, if you have a shortage of serotonin to begin with, which often this is why these drugs are, are uh, prescribed, because there's a shortage of serotonin in that neuron, and so there's not enough serotonin released to be able to produce a synaptic event. If you plug the vacuum cleaners, the serotonin is around for a longer period of time to be able to bind on and produce synaptic activity. But what do you think happens over the course of a year of taking this medicine? when the reuptake is being blocked and the vacuum cleaners are plugged and you had a shortage of serotonin to begin with, you actually cause the very thing that they were designed to treat. Because now there's a serotonin, a much greater serotonin deficit because we're not able to vacuum the serotonin in. The only serotonin that nerve makes is the ones it can actually manufacture. It's not able to vacuum back up all of the serotonin that it releases every time there's an attempted synapse. And so this is why patients need to not just get on these drugs, they need to continue to see their doctor because relapse is coming their way. It might have helped for a while, but eventually that serotonin um, nerve, uh, that neuron is gonna be depleted and now they're gonna need higher doses they're going to need multiple more medicines, and the individual ends up becoming what we call a psychiatric cripple, where they're needing three different medicines, four different medicines, and then we do the scores on them a year after taking all of that, and they still have severe depression, and now they're on all of these drugs. Temple University actually has demonstrated in, in well-designed studies to show that every time antidepressants are released in a new community, even in third world countries, because depression, I just came from Kenya, and depression is, be, is dramatically increasing in Kenya right now. One of the reasons why it's increasing, even, it was even in the headline newspaper, shock, depression, increasing in Kenya due to smartphones. Over 50% of Kenyans now own a smartphone. <laughs> and they're having depression, and so they're going to their doctor, and their doctor is prescribing these drugs. And the studies show that whenever these drugs are released, the rates of depression dramatically increase a year after their release. And so these are medicines that, and as a physician, I'm not saying I don't prescribe them. There may be times I do prescribe them, but I'm gonna prescribe them for short-term situations while we take care of the underlying problem as to why there's not enough serotonin to begin with. Because we can do a lot better by helping the neuron manufacture more serotonin or do a lot better by picking up more receptors. One of the ways of picking up more receptors is physical exercise. That's why it's not nutrition by itself. But there's things like exercise and be getting, more, getting more fit that is going to um, help us. 
So let's take a look at some of the common nutrition hits. These are things that are going to cause us to have less synaptic activity. Not enough tryptophan. And we need not only tryptophan in our diet, but we need to get the tryptophan from our gut into our brain. And that's even a bigger problem. Because tryptophan is an amino acid that is turned into serotonin in the daytime. It's turned into melatonin at night. And it also can be turned into niacin. Now, what does serotonin help us with? Well, serotonin indirectly can help us with sleep because we need to make serotonin first before we can make melatonin at night. Melatonin is your fix and rejuvenate nighttime hormone. That's some of the things, the benefits that we get uh, from sleep and also from darkness. Uh, this is why it's not good to have light 24 hours a day. You're not going to be able to make the melatonin even if your eyes are closed. Uh, and so that can be an issue. Uh, but a serotonin is helping us with what besides indirectly sleep? It helps us with mood, yes. It can help our, our mood to stay stable, even, under, even when there's bad situations going on. Uh, what else can it help us with? Okay, it, it helps us uh, pre prevent ourselves from going into panic when things are bad. When there's a panic attack, anxiety, those sorts of things, that's often a serotonin deficit. And it actually does help us to manage our emotions. There's some frontal lobe enhancing activity with serotonin. The problem with it is it's the least abundant amino acid in the diet. And uh, so it's harder to get than it is other amino acids. But once we get the amino acid in the diet, we have to convert it to 5-HTP in the brain. And that is inhibited if we're really stressed out. So we might be getting enough tryptophan in our diet, but the stressful situation is prohibiting us from making serotonin. Insulin resistance is another thing that prevents us from making serotonin. What is another term for insulin resistance? Diabetes. Or uh, what's another name if it's not diabetes? There's, you can have insulin resistance without diabetes. It's called metabolic syndrome or prediabetes. This is why everyone that comes to our program, we're measuring their metabolism, we're measuring their, their insulin resistance because we might need to be able to get them have more, to allow them to make more serotonin by fixing that aspect of things. And it may not be so much um, a lack of tryptophan issue. If you're short in magnesium, you actually won't make serotonin or melatonin. This is why uh, I was just talking in the car on the way over about some uh, natural sleep aids, and magnesium is one of those because it can help you uh, turn your tryptophan into serotonin and then melatonin at night. Uh, vitamin B6 deficiency will also be a challenge in making serotonin and also lack of light. And this is why depression is more common in what season in Oregon? It's more common in the wintertime. And of course, you have two things going on together that are challenging you as far as the light is concerned. What are those two things in the wintertime? Uh, of course, there's not as much light. The sunrise and the sunset are far, the sunrise is far later and the sunset is far earlier. So you don't have as much um, uh, daylight hours. But the other challenge is, in the wintertime, there tends to be, somebody mentioned fog, uh, there tends to be a lot more clouds, more rain, and uh, that does decrease the amount of lux in the, uh, uh, in the ambient light, and that does decrease your ability to make serotonin. And also, the older we get, the less we tend to make. This is why when I was growing up, uh, depression was known to be only a, I mean, basically almost only a challenge once you got past middle age or at the middle age aspect of things. In fact, the, the, the lay term for it was not depression. 
the lay term for depression when I was growing up because I know one of our neighbors started to suffer from it and I was just a kid and I didn't know about it, but I realized something wasn't right with Mrs. McPherson and I asked my family, what's going on with Mrs. McPherson? And they said, she's suffering from a midlife crisis. And uh, that was the term uh, that was used. We don't use that term much anymore because depression now occurs very frequently in teenagers, 25-year-olds. Uh, but the nice thing is, even if you become an old person, if you have everything else in balance, you're still going to be able to make enough serotonin for you. So we can actually make more than we need uh, if we have um, all of these things in line. So once again, you can see the importance of not just nutrition, but the other factors that go along with nutrition to be able to uh, get adequate amounts of serotonin produced. Studies show that Tryptophan improves premenstrual dysphoria from ovulation to the third day of menstruation. It improves both depression and seasonal affective disorder. It also improves insomnia, and it can improve even obstructive sleep apnea. A lot of people are not aware of this treatment, but it's well documented to show that it helps sleep apnea. What's the most effective treatment for sleep apnea? A lot of people know about the CPAP mask. Uh, and uh, that can be effective, but of course it's not just purely beneficial. There's some, um, you know, there's some nuisances uh, related to that CPAP mask. But even more highly effective for 80% of individuals, more highly effective than a CPAP mask, is what? Weight loss, that's right. And so if you are overweight, losing weight down to your lean body weight will get rid of sleep apnea in about 80% of cases. Uh, but there's still 20% that may have issues, but this is where tryptophan can come in, and it can even help those that are overweight as well. But it also helps nicotine withdrawal and other drug withdrawals. This is one of the reasons why people that come to our program They'll often talk about, wow, I didn't realize I was so afraid coming here because I knew I was going to have to get off of caffeine and I was going to have to get off of marijuana and I was going to have to get off my benzos and I thought this is going to end my life coming to this program. But I, it's, and then they realize how easy it was. It wasn't near as difficult as they thought it would be and partly due to the fact that they're now able to make serotonin a lot better. Particularly, we're giving them light therapy. In the wintertime, even at Weimar, the sun doesn't get up at 6 in the morning. So what are we doing for their light? We're using a medical-grade light box, a Philips uh, light box. And now there's new technology that we've just invested in where there's actually light glasses. You actually put it on, and it's the same nanometer wavelength of the blue sky, and it actually will cause that serotonin level to come up to reset your body clock and you can walk around and even exercise outdoors it, in the uh, morning and get your blue light that way as if the sun is, is shining. Uh, and, uh, and this, of course, produces some benefit and it's easier, of course, to be able to get off of things like nicotine. And, you know, a lot of people think nicotine is... Uh, uh, addiction is becoming a thing of the past. Uh, but it is actually making a dramatic rise. In fact, I can't remember a program where we haven't had somebody that, you know, smoked their last cigarette at the Sacramento airport before we, we um, brought them over uh, to our program. Uh, and so uh, there's every, every program we have at least one person undergoing nicotine withdrawal. But now in the younger generation, it's really picked up and vaping, and of course they're getting nicotine levels that are sometimes far higher than what are there in cigarettes, and so the addictive potential is even far um, greater, and we're in that crisis right now in this country uh, with the vaping aspect of things. So when I was in medical school, I was told that whole milk was a great source of tryptophan, and you can see it's not a bad source, 46 milligrams per 100 grams, but there are higher sources, black-eyed peas, walnuts, almonds, sesame seeds. If you are not sensitive to gluten, gluten is actually a good source of tryptophan. So, uh, you know, I guess one of the disturbing things to me is that the most common diet ever in the United States, ever endorsed by mankind in the United States, 
is actually a gluten-free diet. You want to guess how many Americans have tried a gluten-free diet? Half. 50% of Americans have attempted to be on a gluten-free diet and have actually gone gluten-free, partly due to the fact that they have gotten this idea because of the, um, you know, the labels and things that gluten must be universally bad. In fact, even your pastor the other day, he was talking about, uh, he was in the grocery store and it had butter. And on the butter it said, gluten-free in big letters. And uh, <laughs> there was a fellow shopper there and he says, look, that butter is gluten-free. And the guy said, who knew? Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, uh, we get this idea that gluten is universally bad. It is actually only bad for those that have celiac disease and only bad for those who might have a gluten sensitivity. And it turns out m the majority of gluten sensitive patients, by the way, celiac disease still only affects less than 1% of the population. As a GI doctor, I know this. We do the tests. I actually do the small bowel biopsies. Uh, and so celiac is less than 1%. It's about 0.8% of the population. If you have celiac disease, you do need to stay away from gluten. And we're very particular about that. Uh, but there are up to 4% of Americans who in tests will actually show some sensitivity to gluten. But it turns out the majority of those are actually not sensitive to the gluten. They're sensitive to the pesticides that tend to go with wheat. And so if they get the organic wheat, they actually find out they're not gluten sensitive like they thought they were. And uh, uh, gluten uh, is sometimes called wheat meat, but wheat has been shown in so many trials to be universally healthy for the brain. One of the reasons is, is not just it helps us make serotonin, but it also helps us to make GABA aminobutyric acid. Uh, and uh, it is very high in glutamine. And, and glutamine is something that is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that can actually help us control our emotions. And so, uh, yeah, there are ways of getting those things without um, a gluten. Uh, and I, sh I should mention, I'm jumping ahead, and I don't know how, um, how much information I'm going to be able to I give you today and still teach because um, I need to finish my portion at 10.30 uh, today and uh, we will have questions and answers after that time. Uh, but uh, I will jump ahead and mention that some people, I, I did mention undermethylation um, yesterday. Uh, the undermethylators are the ones that um, uh, tend to have obsessions, compulsions. They also tend to have the calm exterior, intense interior. Uh, they uh, tend to uh, not necessarily be um, the most social people to those they don't know. Uh, they're more, um, they're kind of on the edge sometimes of social anxiety, not in regards to the people they know. Uh, and, uh, and they also tend to be very competitive and driven, and there's a whole lot of other things that go along with the personality of undermethylation. But if you are, another thing that wheat has that's beneficial is the amino acid methionine. And methionine is what we need in order to be able to methylate more adequately. And so some people that are on a plant-based diet, we've run into this, they're, they're on a plant-based diet, and then they'll tell me they'll eat meat, and they actually feel better, and they think, I'm a person that actually needs meat. No, the problem is they're deficient in methionine. Meat does have methionine, but so does wheat. And so if they truly do have celiac disease for an individual like this, we might actually give them methionine supplements, and it'll work far better than the risks of meat that we'll get into with the arachidonic acid and the pro-inflammatory aspects plus the low antioxidants uh, of meat. And so uh, this is why, um, and you know, the other thing that, uh, that comes to mind, particularly with a biblical-based audience, which I assume most of you are here today, is that Christ himself called himself the what of life? You know, if bread was universally bad, I don't think he would have told <laughs> us that that's what he was. Uh, and so there are some healthy things in regards to uh, bread 
uh, obviously. It's kind of uh, our, our sustenance, where we get some good nutrition from, and the evidence in the scientific literature today is still very much there. Uh, by the way, I was in Brazil recently, and uh, I was uh, mentioning these types of things to the Brazilian aud audience. And uh, one of the ladies there in the front row had written or had read this book called Wheat Belly, where it told you about all the problems of wheat, it, as if wheat is the problem of obesity and things like that. It's not really wheat, it's what people are putting on the wheat uh, and, and those uh, sorts of things. Wheat is not a uh, high caloric density uh, per se. Uh, but uh, it is true that if you leave a whole um, staple out of your diet and don't replace it, you will lose weight because you're dropping off of those calories. But anyway, she thought gluten was universally bad, and so she had had her whole family on a gluten-free diet for four years, and they were starting to get into trouble. I could see even looking at them, they seemed a little emaciated and pale and things. And the next um, day when I came there, her husband came up to me and said, I want to thank you to come all the way from Brazil because last night for the first time in four years, my wife baked bread and we all had bread last night and this morning and we're already feeling better. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, but gluten is not the top source of tryptophan. Pumpkin seeds are higher yet and even tofu is uh, higher yet, uh, soybean um, cured. But it's not just the tryptophan in the diet. We want to get tryptophan into the brain. Tryptophan, uh, well, let me get into the blood-brain barrier. Uh, have you heard of the blood-brain barrier? The arteries change very significantly as soon as they get into our brain. They become like steel pipes. And it's very hard to get any large molecules pass them into the brain. The reason why is because our brain, uh, it get, gets back to the cells, when our brain cells die, they can't be rejuvenated. You can't actually form new brain cells. And the oldest cells in our body are actually in our brain. In embryology, the first thing to get formed is your brain. Those stem cells are all going into the brain. And those brain uh, neurons that were formed when you were a fetus, you actually still have. It's not like other organs in the skin where you're constantly turning over and making new cells. Uh, and so the oldest living cells in your body are actually the brain cells, and they're actually meant to last your entire life. Uh, I mentioned yesterday how the brain is also different. The brain is, is not meant to deteriorate um, with age. Um, it's actually supposed to get better, and you're supposed to be wiser. Um, and so one of the ways of keeping those cells alive is preventing toxins from getting into the brain and manipulating that brain or actually destroying it. And so... Uh, that's one of the enigmas of alcohol, because alcohol is a small molecule. It passes through that blood-brain barrier, and it actually does destroy brain cells. Uh, and uh, that's another reason why we shouldn't consume alcohol. But tryptophan is bigger than alcohol. Tryptophan will not cross the blood-brain barrier without a carrier. And so when we need things like tryptophan, um, by design, there are carriers to carry this across. Now, if tryptophan easily diffused over, we would end up having our brain deteriorate over time because there's other molecules that big that would be toxic to the brain. And so it's very helpful that we actually need a carrier to get tryptophan across. But there are five different amino acids, actually six, including tryptophan, that are called large neutral amino acids. For those of you wanting to study biochemistry, there's an abbreviation of those called LNAA, large neutral amino acids. And they're large and a neutral, meaning they're not acidic or basic, uh, and they will um, only come across the blood-brain barrier with the same carrier. It's the same carrier that carries all six of these across. But remember, the one that is most in undersupply is tryptophan. So 
if you take a look at milk up there, and before I go much, too much for well, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this part first, but also listen to the second part. Uh, milk has 40% tryptophan and 60% of the competition. So when we consume milk, we're going to get more of the, the competitors going across, uh, those, those other large neutral amino acids, than we will milk. Uh, but there's something else that's also needed for tryptophan to cross the blood-brain barrier. And you got a clue from that from a couple of slides ago when I talked about insulin sensitivity. It requires insulin, actually, to get tryptophan into the brain. And in order to have an insulin response to get the tryptophan into the brain, that's why we want to have tryptophan combined with carbs. When we eat it with carbs, we're going to be able to get that insulin response and get the tryptophan into the brain. Now, turkey, for instance, is high in tryptophan, uh, but is a car it is a carbohydrate deficient food, a lot of fat, a lot of protein, Plus, it has a lot of those competitors, a lot more than what milk does. And so we'll get the tryptophan into muscles. We'll get it into enzymes that are not in the brain. But we're not going to be able to get the turkey tryptophan uh, crossing appreciably into that blood-brain barrier. So if you take a look at those first two, milk and salmon, they have the same ratio, 40 to 60%. Which one do you think would get more tryptophan into the brain? Some are saying salmon, uh, most are saying salmon, and some are saying milk. Uh, the milk is correct, and, and salmon, even though it has the same ratio, salmon is once again a carbohydrate deficient food, high in protein, high in fat, virtually no carbs. This is why in medical school I was told milk for tryptophan into the brain to be able to make serotonin and melatonin. Uh, because it had those carbs, and they didn't tell me about salmon as a good way of getting that across. So now that you understand that principle, let's look at three that have even better ratios than milk, beef, chicken, and brown rice. Which one of those would get more tryptophan into the brain? Brown rice by far, so you get the idea. Black-eyed peas are higher yet, soybeans higher yet, walnuts higher yet, pumpkin seeds Higher yet, tofu is actually not at the top as far as the ratio is concerned. There's two foods you, where you'll get more tryptophan into the brain than tofu. And that is almonds, our number two. And can anyone see what number one is? It's sesame seeds. Uh, and this is one of the advantages of hummus, you know, which is made out of sesame seed butter or tahini. Uh, and uh, this is actually a very good way of being able to get the substrate that you need to make um, serotonin, and it can make a significant difference. I know in our program, most people that have come to our program have never had tahini till they come to the program. They've, more people have had hummus than they've had tahini, and our chef makes a very good hummus. But with tahini, the first time they try it, they're not sure they like it. You know, it has kind of a bitter aftertaste. But I've noticed that after their fourth exposure, they can't get enough of it. Uh, they develop a taste for it very quickly, and, uh, and they really start enjoying it. It might be some of the effects that they're noticing as well. In stress-prone subjects, high-carb, low-protein food prevents a deterioration of mood and performance under uncontrollable laboratory stress conditions. Our country is so much emphasizing protein, protein, protein all the time. But actually, we do better in making serotonin if we have lower protein and higher natural carbs. Now, by low protein, it doesn't mean insufficient protein. It doesn't mean deficient in protein. But most Americans are getting four to five times the amount of protein they need. And a lot of that is competition to tryptophan. And a lot of that is preventing that tryptophan from going into the brain. But this study showed high carb, low protein is going to prevent a mood and deterioration. Why is that? Stress prone subjects have a higher risk of brain what? Serotonin deficiency. It's one of the reasons why they're, they're more stress prone. And this would be your undermethylator. Undermethylators are going to have a tendency for um, low serotonin activity. In sub-subjects, higher natural carbs 
increase what? Personal control. So this is the management of their emotions, and it can also increase their self-control as well. Carbohydrates prevent a functional shortage of central serotonin during acute stress due to their potentiating effect on brain tryptophan. And this is why we don't advocate a low-carb diet. A lot of people are wanting to go to ketosis for their brain to improve, and there are some advantages of ketosis that we're going to get into. But the way the typical American does ketosis is uh, talking about the paleo diet and those type of diets where it's very low in carbs and much higher in protein, and you are going to have more serot a lot more serotonin challenges. And it's not really a sustainable diet. A, a low-carb diet is not a sustainable diet over time uh, because of the effects it is going to have on brain chemistry. It's far better to get into ketosis a way that we're going to be describing here uh, later on. Another important amino acid is tyrosine. Tyrosine is incorporated in proteins of all life forms and is a precursor for the synthesis of thyroxin. What is thyroxin? That's your thyroid hormone. Is that important for brain health? Yes, it is, and physical health as well. Melanin and kephalins and two neurotransmitters. What are the neurotransmitters that come out of tyrosine? Dopamine and norepinephrine. Now, let's describe those a little bit. What does dopamine help us with? Dopamine is going to help us with motivation. One of the hallmark symptoms of depression is apathy. This is when you wake up in the morning and you're not excited about the day. You wake up in the morning and you get up, but it's out of a sense of duty and responsibility and not interest. And that is a dopamine problem. You either have very low dopamine levels or you have destroyed a lot of your dopamine receptors. And for many people with severe depression, it's a combination of both of those. And there are certain lifestyle factors that will really diminish dopamine receptors. I think we talked about one of them yesterday uh, in, the, uh, in the morning um, service when we talked about Solomon. His dopamine levels would have gone, his dopamine receptors would have gone way low uh, as a result of this. But uh, dopamine is important uh, also um, for even wanting to learn. I would assume that most of you here today, unless you were told to come here by somebody else, most of you here today at least have some dopamine and dopamine receptors because that is what we um, need for love of learning. If you have a love of learning, you actually do have some dopamine there. You do have some dopamine receptors, but those that don't have dopamine or dopamine receptors, they're not going to want to come to a meeting like this, even though they do have apathy. It's like, you know, they don't want to learn. By the way, did anyone invite someone here today that you don't see? Okay, there's some hands going up. Uh, those are the people that actually needed to be here more than you needed to be here <laughs> uh, to learn about these things and to, uh, and to put it into practice. But fortunately, if they do come to our program, uh, they will actually get on things that start to improve their dopamine receptors and their dopamine levels and their love of learning can go up considerably. Norepinephrine, what does that help us with? Well, epinephrine is your fight or flight. Uh, epinephrine is adrenaline. No, norepinephrine is a cousin to this but you can get an idea a little bit for the fight or flight. The norepinephrine is going to give us energy, and it's also going to help us with memory uh, and focus. And so uh, tyrosine is also a potent antioxidant and also stimulates growth hormone production. And of course, this makes us anabolic. This is where we're building up our body and not uh, deteriorating it over time. It may be a therapeutic benefit in improving depression, high blood pressure, stress, cognitive function, memory, Parkinson's disease, PKU, and narcolepsy. Looking around the room to see if we have anybody here with narcolepsy. Uh, what is narcolepsy? Does anyone know what that is? This is when you're wanting to stay awake, but you just can't. You sit down and you fall asleep. 
and narcolepsy often uh, is very well treated with uh, tyrosine. And uh, interestingly, a tyrosine helps high blood pressure. There are antidepressants that are trying to work with norepinephrine, these SNRIs. SNRIs are selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, so they're plugging the norepinephrine reuptake channels. Those are going to increase your blood pressure, and uh, they can actually cause more hypertension. And so uh, it's far better to get on something that's going to help you with both. Uh, and that's how things are when we do it naturally. It often helps us with a lot more things and we don't have the side effects. Those given tyrosine have significantly reduced headache. We will see some improvements in migraines and even tension headaches, stress, fatigue, muscle aches, and sleepiness compared to controls. Improvements were noted in mood, mental states, happiness, mental clarity, hostility, and tension, and cognitive tests. Math tests improve. Coding map compass, pattern recognition in the tyrosine group. Now, uh, to give you an idea of how effective uh, sometimes this can be, we had a patient that we had declined. Uh, I know some of you have asked about relatives and, and others getting into the program, and I know the fear is that maybe they won't be accepted uh, or not. And uh, this individual had called and had been declined um, to um, come to the program. And um, uh, her husband then took over and was calling for her. And our nurse was still declining her. And finally he says, I think Dr. Nedley's going to have more compassion than you. Um, can you please ask Dr. Nedley, run this up to him and run her case by and see if he won't accept her. And she says, okay, I'll do that. So she explained to me the situation and said, this lady has advanced Parkinson's disease. She's wheelchair bound. She can't feed herself. She can't dress herself. And of course, we don't have 24 seven nursing care. Ours is an ambulatory program. And, um, and furthermore, she's gonna take up a spot of someone who can exercise. She can't exercise. And so, so when you have limited spots, you have to be uh, more selective. And, uh, and so I agreed um, with her that, um, that we couldn't accept her into the program. Uh, so her, um, her husband called back, and so Le uh, at that time it was Leanne that was our nurse, and Leanne uh, quoted me uh, on the fact that she couldn't go in also because of not 24-7 nursing care, and he says, I will come with her, I am going to be her companion, I will feed her, I will dress her, I will do all of those things. Please let her into the program. And her doctor's referring her, her doctor says she needs this program. So uh, uh, then on our programs normally begin on Thursday. On Monday I got a call from her neurologist at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And he said, please, will you let my patient into your program? <laughs> and so they had gotten a hold of him and had him actually make a direct phone call to me. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, well, you're her Parkinson's doctor, right? And it was a neurologist. And he says, yeah. And so he says, I know that a lot of this is due to the Parkinson's. And I am treating her with, you know, the most modern stuff that we can treat her with, with Parkinson's. I'm not asking you to treat the Parkinson's. But a lot of her problems are depression. And I know she would benefit greatly from your program. So after that phone call, I called Leanne back. And, of course, the program was filled. But I said, uh, if there's any cancellations, why don't you just move her to the top of the list? Um, and um, we'll... We'll let her in as long as the husband is still going to be here and provide the 24-7 care. So there was no cancellations until Thursday morning. And then someone canceled, and so Leanne called her right away, and they got on the first flight out of Baltimore and came to Sacramento. And our other staff had not been updated in regards to this change in situation. And so our director out in California uh, goes into a panic mode when he sees this wheelchair-driven lady with advanced Parkinson's coming to our depression and anxiety recovery program. 
and I'm seeing another patient and I get a knock on the door from the director and the director comes in and says, do you know who just pulled up? They came all the way from the East Coast. She can't feed herself. She can't dress herself. How in the world did we let this person into the program? And she was thinking that we had just totally destroyed protocol and all of those things. And uh, I said, well, you know, she's not officially in until she sees me, but um, let's just see what happens after she sees me. So um, we moved things around so I could see her right away after that patient. And I wanted to see what her husband would say. And the husband says, I am going to do everything for her. I'm going to feed her. I'm going to dress her. I'm going to do all of these things. Thank you so much for letting her into the program. We're so grateful. And he was just moved that the fact that he was even there. And uh, so after that visit, I told her, I said, you know, you have problems making dopamine. That's what Parkinson's is, is a dopamine problem. Not really brain-wide, but in the brain stem itself. And it's from toxins destroying the dopamine-producing cells. It's once again toxins getting in and destroying these cells that prevent the dopamine from being made. And I said, you know, for the cells that can make the dopamine, I'd like to kind of saturate it with tyrosine. So I'm going to put you on some high-dose tyrosine supplements. And it may not do much, but let's just see what, what can happen. So at least we can look at this. And then I looked at all the other things affecting her depression and put her on the regimen that would be best for her. And she took the tyrosine that night. She took it that morning. And I wasn't there that morning, but our staff saw it. Uh, she... Um, it came time for the uh, breakfast, which is about 7.15. So at 7, she's uh, getting ready. He had dressed her in things, and now she actually gets up out of the wheelchair and starts walking uphill to the cafeteria. And her husband says, Honey, don't. You're going to fall. Let me help you. And she says, Get out of my way. And she's walking now <laughs> for the first time uh, in, in quite a while. And uh, you can imagine that she had a great uh, program. In fact, her, her husband still sends us a gift every six months or so uh, to thank us for the benefit. Now, we didn't cure the Parkinson's. I don't want you to get an idea that the Parkinson's was cured. Uh, but if tyrosine can do that for a Parkinson's patient, what do you think it can do with someone else that has issues with apathy or also issues with attention deficit? Because a lot of times with the attention deficit disorder, these Adderall patients, or if they're on Vyvanse or amphetamines or things of that nature, uh, the tyrosine can be a nice substitute so that they can still have focus and concentration uh, without getting into the addictive aspects of things. So a little different set of foods that are high in tyrosine. Mustard greens, lamb's quarters, tomatoes. Tofu comes out pretty good in tyrosine. Edamame is even better. What is edamame? That's your green soybeans. So uh, we um, serve those green soybeans at uh, Weimar. Uh, eggs, almonds, oats, sunflower seeds. Peanuts are actually up there near the top as, as far as tyrosine. And pumpkin and squash seeds are actually even higher yet. Uh, I, the, um, I'm staying at your pastor's uh, house and yesterday, she introduced me to a butter that has pumpkin seeds and almonds and flax seeds and uh, five different seeds, chias in there too, uh, I believe, uh, and, uh, and some cashews, so five-in-one butter that they have at Costco's of all places. Uh, and uh, so I had that on my waffles this morning, and uh, I think it's given me some energy here this morning. So, uh, but tyrosine has less competitors, but it is also large enough that it needs a carrier to get into the brain. And there are three competitors that compete with it. These are the foods that are in the top of the list as far as less competition. Sweet potatoes, flaxseed, chia seeds. Uh, we, sh you know, we really shouldn't have beef on the list, although beef, we were just looking at the top 10 as far as the ratios. Beef has a better ratio. But once again, tyrosine is a ditto to tryptophan. We need carbs. It's an insulin response to get tyrosine across. And so beef would not be your best source. Tofu, pumpkin seeds are actually not at the top as far as the ratio. Soybeans are higher yet. Spirulina is higher yet. But the two highest are watermelon 
and mustard greens. Now, how does this come into play? Uh, we had an individual come through our program that had anxiety and some depression, but he was primarily anxiety. And he was, of course, ours is a caffeine-free program. We don't want to suppress that frontal lobe. And, of course, caffeine and anxiety go hand in hand. And so he was doing a lot better without the caffeine. But then as he was getting close to being going home, he said, Dr. Nedley, I'm worried because I make my living driving a truck for an oil company that produces parts for oil drilling. And sometimes I get a call right when I'm ready to go home at 5 p.m. that I need to deliver this, de this piece to Albuquerque, New Mexico because they've got 100 people out there drilling and now they're out, they've had you know, broken pieces or things like that, and so they call and, and they pay for this overnight shipping, and it's me that actually ships it uh, to them so that these men don't have to sit around for a whole day being paid, a hundred of them. And so uh, he says, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this without caffeine. And I said, once you're caffeine free for two weeks, you will actually be able to stay awake with tyrosine foods if you're eating them in the evening. So he said, so what foods would that be? I said, well, you have a choice, mustard greens or watermelon. <laughs> what do you think he chose? <laughs> he chose watermelon. And he said it works like a charm. He says, unlike the caffeine, it would keep him awake, but it gave him, it made him feel wired. He didn't necessarily like the effect. And of course, it fueled the anxiety as well. But he said, with a watermelon, I stay awake, and I can stay awake all night. And he says, I actually feel good, and I can deliver that part to Albuquerque, and it does not fuel at all the anxiety uh, part of things. Now, if he would have been a diabetic, I wouldn't have given him a choice. It would have been mustard greens and not watermelon. So don't chow down on high-protein sources to boost either tyrosine or tryptophan. Um, choose emphasize carbohydrate-rich plant sources of nutrition. Of course, watermelon is nice and high in those carbohydrates, and it really helps. Now, for those of you who are on caffeine, watermelon's not going to necessarily keep you awake. Uh, that's why you have to have withdrawal from the caffeine. But once you're caffeine-free, um, you don't want to have watermelon in the evening. Uh, you know, that's more of a, a morning food or a lunchtime food. Uh, but not a late-in-the-evening food because it'll start delaying your circadian rhythms. Another cause of depression and or anxiety are low folate levels. Such depression has been shown unresponsive to medicine. So, you know, if you're short in tryptophan or tyrosine, I, I, um, you can get on medicine that will seem to help you for a while. These are the ones that are plugging these vacuum cleaners, and so people are getting a response. With folate deficiency, they won't get any response with those medicines. And folate is very important in producing three different neurotransmitters. And the U.S. government says it's undersupplied in the typical American's diet, which is true. We need 400 micrograms for optimal physical health. But they're only looking at the physical health side of things. For optimal mental health, it's better to have 1,000 micrograms of folate. And you can see this is a double serving of steak. 16 micrograms, you'd have to eat so much steak to get a thousand that you might actually die that day. Uh, and so, fortunately, there are a lot better sources of folate. Parsnips, pineapple, orange juice, peanuts, mustard greens come, and again, spinach is higher than mustard greens. Navy beans are quite high in folate. Okra is even higher yet. Do you grow okra up here in Oregon? No. And some say yes. Very rare to have okra. Yeah, in Oklahoma, where I came from, it was grown in abundance. I think that's where it got its okay at the beginning from. Uh, okay raw. And uh, uh, lentils, uh, 831 micrograms of folate. And the highest source of folate? Black-eyed peas. One cup will give you all you need for the day, 1,057 micrograms. And we have a grower in the Sacramento Valley that grows organic black-eyed peas. They're very good 
have a nice, uh, naturally sweet um, taste, and we use it uh, in abundance uh, in our program. Uh, atherosclerosis, causing heart disease or many strokes, can also lead to depression and anxiety due to lack of circulation in the brain. But high cholesterol in and of itself can do it. Patients with major depression tend to have significantly higher cholesterol levels than healthy adults. Depressed patients with elevated cholesterol have a poorer prognosis for treatment response. Lowering cholesterol levels improves depression and mood and also improves what? Impulsivity. By the way, there's, that's one of the enigmas of the vacuum cleaner pluggers. The vacuum cleaner pluggers can improve mood, but they worsen impulsivity. And that's why they have big black box warnings on them. You know what those black box warnings say it can happen when these people start taking these medicines? And this is the enigma of you know, the benefits versus the risks in physicians prescribing these drugs. The black box warning says it will increase their risk of suicide when they first start taking it. Because suicide is often an impulsive act. And it will worsen their impulsivity before it improves their mood. Now, after about a month of taking it, it balances out enough so it doesn't lower the risk of suicide, but it keeps it about neutral because the mood increase is somewhat balanced with the worsen impulsivity. Another problem with these drugs is a lot of people like them that have crying spells because they're feeling their emotions, but when you start plugging the vacuum cleaners, you become a little more numb um, in your emotions. And, of course, that produced also its risk. We had a lady come to our program that started to have depression due to some behaviors of her husband. And her husband got into a gambling addiction. And, uh, and there were some other factors as well. But a doctor, to handle the depression that she was having, put her on SSRIs. The SSRIs caused an I-don't-care attitude. And uh, that I don't care attitude put no brakes on her husband, and her husband ended up spending the entire retirement and even had to go into the mortgage of the house in order to fund his gambling addiction. And uh, by the time she realized all its effects, it's like I should have had some emotions. I think if I'd had emotions, I would have done something and might have been able to stop all of this. And so, uh, once again, it's far better to get things that are going to have benefits without the side effects.